How's everybody doing? Okay, the, you guys are like all in the back. Everybody's spread out. So, I'm so. I, you, everybody in the back row. You guys want to move up? No. All right. Well, the first thing I wanted to do before we get into the slides, um, first I'd like to know who who knows about what category management is. So we just so that we can kind of get to know our audience a little bit. Few folks, okay, who does not know what category management is, and that's why they're here to learn about it. Okay, here's the good one. Who thinks they know what category management is, but has, doesn't quite know? Okay, so we're going to get into some myth busting, and I wanted to introduce so uh, as a when you, when you're briefing on something, you always bring about a support team. So we have a support team here. And if any of our, uh, the audience members want to meet with our small business counterpart, we also brought our small business expert. So I'm going to introduce you to our support team here. So Alan, Alan is from 771 Enterprise Sourcing Squadron. And he has a um, esteemed um, long line of uh, program management expertise. And Julian is our 771 Enterprise Sourcing Squadron, actually the Deputy Commander. And then we have Roger. Roger is a category management guru. He's been working category management since at least 2014, if not earlier. Um, and we're going to go through some of the history of where category management came from, how it started, why we do it, what we're looking for. And then Dave, Dave is our, our um, he's offered to do, if anybody has any one-on-one -on -one questions afterwards um, that you don't want to ask during our dialogue today, um, Dave has offered to um, be available after the, the briefing. And then we have Sylvia. Sylvia is our strategic communications expert um, for the Air Force Installation Contracting Center. So, um, all right. Next slide, please. All right. Here's our purpose. And I actually, I feel like I should get from behind the lectern because I almost don't feel tall enough. Can you see me? If I come over here, can you hear me or do I have to be in front of the microphone? What do you think? In front of the microphone or both? Okay, I might wonder. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, introduce you to what the category management principles are, what the actual goals of category management are, and we have um, some of the OMB's most recent policy letter that they've issued, and we're going to let you read that, and then of course you probably want to do some uh, more reading and research on your own, but we'll introduce you to that, and do not hesitate to ask questions because we're we're mostly and primarily here to educate and um, learn from each other. Okay. Next slide. All right. This is the basic definition, and as General Bunch just said, um, he 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 wanted to make sure he was loud and that he was throwing some jokes in there so nobody falls asleep. Um, on this slide, we have the definition here. You might fall asleep while you're reading it, but this is the OMB definition. Um, it's, a, it's, an, it's a structural process, and if you remember anything from today's education forum, it's that category management is about strategic cost ownership. It's about understanding a category of spend at, at a high level so you can make strategic decisions. So you can make actionable decisions based on the intelligence that you get. But when OMB uh, in 2014 said that all federal agencies are going to start using category management principles, there wasn't a whole lot of information out at the time. And so we've evolved over the last five years and we're going to kind of introduce you to some of that evolution. and again, um, give some of the myths that are out there, the, the background of how we got here, the, some of the principles behind category management so that you can learn from that. And then the guidance that we talked about from OMB, the success stories that we have, which is why we brought members from the 771 Enterprise Sourcing Squadron, because they have been on this journey with us and they have a lot of, um, some of their contracts have been awarded through using the category management principles. And then last, of course, Dave, we already introduced him, but we give you a, sl a list that has all of our small business uh, points of contact for future information. All right, next slide. Okay, myth busting. The first myth 
is category management is the same as strategic sourcing. That's a myth because strategic sourcing or an acquisition solution is only one of the principles that category management may use. Um, we often look at a category of spend, and we'll, we, we'll show those in a future slides of what we're looking at, the 10 common areas of spend that are common across all government agencies. But we look at policies, we look at industry best practices, and we look at our own demand behavior. Sometimes, I know this may, um, even in your own households, do you ever find that you buy something that you shouldn't have bought? No, everybody's right. Somebody, somebody's out there like, no, I buy only things that I need. Um, we all buy some things that maybe I shouldn't have purchased. And you'll either re-gift it, <laughs> you'll, you'll either donate it, or sometimes you'll throw it away. And what the government wants to do, and we must do, because we, we are driven by cost effectiveness and making sure that we make every dollar count for our taxpayers' money so that we're good stewards of the government taxpayers that we receive, but we want to understand our buying behaviors. And when we look at data and we pull the data for over these common areas of spend, if we understand buying behavior, we can make better buying decisions. Now, sometimes that the 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 number one um, uh, end of fiscal year spending habits between July and September sometimes are based on when we receive money, but over the whole fiscal year, when you can um, standardize that buying behavior, you're not doing um, unnecessary spikes or purchases at the end of the fiscal year. And so we look at that. I know you're, you're, you all know one of the areas, probably, right? What, what do you think we buy a lot of in September that would be really nice if we had bought it throughout the whole year? Computers. Computers. I knew somebody would get it. And it's just an, it's an area that we look at, and so that's one of our common areas of information technology. All right, the second myth is that category management is untested and proven. Could not be further from the truth. I told you that Mr. Roger Westmeyer, he's been working on category management within our organization and for the Air Force since 2014, but it's been around for decades, and it started with industry. It started um, with the, we have um, UPS, Johnson & Johnson, Walmart, and we, the government, we learn a lot from our industry partners. And as General Bunch said in the last session, one of the reasons we're here at Industry Day is so that we can have those improved partnerships. Everything that we're doing today is in line with the National Defense Strategy. And this, the, um, the areas that we're doing, um, those priorities in the National Defense Strategy. So do random poll, who's read the National Defense Strategy? Okay, who has not read it yet? Okay, so you can Google the National Defense Strategy and it's only 11 pages. There is a classified version, um, but if you're, you know, it, you got to be on a classified network to get that one. It's a little bit, um, I think it's 53 pages. But the 11 page um, unclassified version is publicly available and it shows you what our, uh, what the Department of Defense is focused in on and what Secretary Mattis, who signed out the National Defense Strategy in January of 2018, where we're still working and aligning most of the, the behavior that the government is focused on today. And it's lethality, it's um, building partnerships and alliances, and it's business reforms. And category management fits underneath every single one of those priorities. When we're using category management to be more efficient in our buying behavior or in our buying practices, that means that we have more money to spend on combat capability, so we're improving lethality, and we're building our partnerships with not just the defense industry, um, but uh, with um, universities, with academia, and we're learning from them, and we're not just going straight to the industry partners that might be a primary, um, a primary awardee, but we're, we're going to like services and industries that can give us information, and we're collecting data. The third myth is that category management hurts small businesses. And the, all of the data that we have in our focus area is to make sure that we are utilizing small businesses and those are factors in our acquisition strategies. When we go to an acquisition, 
that we are including small business up front. And so I'm not going to make you experts on one of our um, one of our programs that we have is a category intelligence report. If we're doing a category intelligence report where we actually div um, divide a team up to focus on a certain area, that CUR at the end and at the beginning will include small business participation um, membership from Dave or one of his counterparts throughout the entire process. And we, we know that, that that voice of small business and we have uh, lots of capable small businesses um, who here in the audience is a small business? And so highly capable small businesses. Who in the audience is a large business? So we got a few. So we have partnerships between large businesses and small businesses, and we have um, partnerships with large businesses and small businesses um, in, you know, individually for an acquisition. But this says uh, the central tenet is to make sure that we're exceeding or meeting what the current small business participation is. And so we track that number. We, we owe that to our leadership to make sure that we're keeping small business concerns and socioeconomic socio concerns um, at the forefront. The fourth myth is that reducing the number of duplicative contracts will reduce the size of the acquisition workforce. Uh, you may not have heard that myth, but it, it is something that uh, within some organizations, think that if you save money automatically that you're going to cut personnel. But what this is trying to do with the savings is to make sure that we are focusing our efforts on all of our priorities that we have to do. So here, here's another question I, I like. Um, who in the audience does not feel like they're overwhelmed at times? Anybody feel like they can do everything that they have to do every day, and when they're leaving out the door at 5, 530, that they've done everything, or is there some, there's usually a, like a stack on the, on the desk at the end of the day? Anybody? No, we're, so you're, you, everybody feel a little bit overworked? Except for Tom Robinson, he's like underworked and overpaid, <laughs> right? That's, that's the goal. Now, the, we, we often, we're working on certain priorities, but guess what? If you, if you are buying more efficiently and if you understand, as I said earlier, strategic cost ownership and your categories of spend, you can make better decisions on a, at the enterprise level or at the regional level and some, sometimes even at the local level that allows and frees up time to be able to knock down your list of priorities. And that is what one of the principles behind category management is that time savings. Now, I know we don't often get straight to the acquisition solution, but if, if just thinking through what enterprise sourcing is, and not category management, but enterprise sourcing as one of the subsets where we, we have decided that we are going to do an acquisition on this, an enterprise sourcing acquisition, if I have 10 installations, and in the Air Force we have 75 installations. So if I have 75 installations, or if I'm in a region and I'm just looking at 10, and they are all buying one type of um, a commodity, if I then take the individual, that amount of commodity at all 75 bases or a regional purchasing strategy for 10 bases, and only one base has to purchase for all, or one base has to do a source selection, and then the other nine bases can do the, um, just order off of that end award, that end contract document. How much time have I saved? And I don't like to do math in public, but let's just say that a source selection takes 100 days. If I've just, instead of say, spending 1,000 days collectively for all 10 organizations to do a source selection, and I only do 100 days, I have just saved 900 days for the other nine entities. They do not have to do that. Once the, it's awarded, then they can award or task order against it. But now they can do something else in their 100 days of savings, each individually. And so that's, that's a systemic level um, a, 
a more systemic way of, uh, systematic way of thinking, um, more than a linear th way of thinking, and just saying, no, you're, you just um, worry about what's in your, on your own installation and, and don't kind of team. And we're, we're all about teaming, we're all about collaborating, um, not just with our small businesses and large businesses and defense industry at large, but also within our own contracting communities and with our own acquisition communities. So that's why the last one is so important. It's, it's no, we're not trying to cut people. What we're trying to do is make sure that you're being as most efficient as you can with your time. All right, next line. Okay, these are the common areas of spend, and we show you this because um, we already talked about information technology, but professional services is one of our largest areas of spend, and it has some of the, um, this is the taxonomy, taxonomy that the um, Office of Management Budget has given us, and the Air Force uses it. And security protection, facilities and construction, industrial products and services, and transportation and logistics. So for all of those that I just read that have a green circle on it, we, the Air Force, has appointed a category manager. And that's a category manager that is the champion of that area, that, ca that common level of spend, and they report to um, uh, our staff MG, uh, Mr. Lombardi, as the chief management office, who is the overarching category manager, uh, decisions on that category and so in information technology if the category manager um, is looking at spending behavior in that er in those areas software hardware and um, services then they'll make decisions based on the data that they collect that goes up and this is a decision that will impact the Air Force wide and so that's how the Air Force looks at these common levels of spend what's interesting is that some of the areas overlap now um, it, by, by show of hands, uh, majority, anybody in the information technology realm? Okay, very high. Okay, and then professional services, ANAS. Okay, we probably hit um, ANAS. The, um, as I said, it's one of the highest levels. It hits a lot of where we're at today for Life Cycle Management Center. So if you're on a weapon system contract, we will have ANAS services and ANAS support. Um, anybody in security and protection? Okay. Um, General Bunch said, uh, where did, he said what were the two portfolios that he was least um, knowledgeable on? Air Force installation, AFIMSC, Air Force installation and support mission, cent um, mission command, or center, sorry. And the other one was sustainment center. And so AFIMSC, they have the Security Force Protection Office, and they are um, the number one customer for that portfolio. The uh, facilities and construction also falls under AFIMSC. Do we have any construction businesses? Okay. Um, and industrial products and services and transportation and logistics, probably not just here based on what your, the audience is supporting Lifecycle Management Center. All right. But what's interesting, um, you'll just see this like the green, the reason that we've appointed those category managers and not the, the blue areas, those um, together, the green amounts 94% of the category of spend in that area, and that's a target of opportunity. So the remaining four only cover 6% of the spend. And so when you're looking at the common levels of spend and you, you see where the Air Force is spending its money, you see where the Department of Defense is spending its money, those are where you want to target just the same as we are where we're prioritizing. Okay? Next slide. All right. So category management background, I already talked about this a little bit earlier. It started in 2014. The most recent guidance out there is presidential guidance in 2018 saying you will, you know, you will follow these, um, the principles and um, making sure that it's standardized in a, in a way for the guidance across all of the executive agencies um, and the, um, through, the, through the federal government. Um, we keep talking about the data and the, not many people today are, are making decisions just based on, um, well, not data. And that data-driven piece, you might go in, I talked about a, a category intelligence report occur, 
you might go in, the category management say, this is a focus area. I have a gut instinct that we're, we're buying this, this commodity in an inefficient manner, and so now I want you to go look at it. And the gut instinct might start you off on the project, but it's the data that shows us what we're truly going after. Our, you know, our buying behavior, wow, information technology. Um, we don't buy anything in the government in October, September, or um, October, November, December, but then start, things start trickling up. So you can see um, how your buying behavior will give you um, not just visually what you want to look for, but also where we want to drive some of our decisions and get that from, um, you know, through our leadership and give that the thumbs up to say, here's how we can better focus on this area. Um, we might have an outdated policy. Um, we need to provide a better policy for the field um, and or uh, the, the common area or the common policy letter that says you will purchase this from either um, this contract vehicle, this strategic vehicle, um, and you won't go outside of that because um, by doing that, we're making sure that we're getting, you know, meeting our numbers and everybody's going to um, the same set of standards. And so we, we look at that, and those are some of our driving um, behaviors that we try to look for. Um, the, the real goal, not just the efficiency, but to make sure that we're buying smarter. And that's why when, uh, there's a, we call um, the levers, and it's rate, process, and demand. And the rate is the easiest thing to go after, and it's the easiest thing to understand. Rate is how can I save money? Can I just negotiate a lower price? Process is our process of buying. It's either our procedures, um, it's, like I said, a policy that's out there that where we need to do better or shore it up because we, we have some escapes. But the demand is really where the market is. If we understand our buying behavior and what we're buying and when we're buying, we can make better decisions. And that demand lever is the hardest one to go after, but that's where we're moving towards and the rate one is the easiest one to go after. And it's the easiest one to understand because we all understand um, you know, the coupon methodology or negotiating strategy and just trying to drive the prices down. but. Category management is not trying to just drive prices down. It's really trying to buy smarter and faster. We talk a lot about acquisition and speed, and once we look at the data, we can make some better decisions so that we can buy faster. Um, and these are just the, the, the lines from our strategic documents, which are sh showing that everything that we're doing is supporting. The National Defense Strategy, we have the Air Force Strategic Master Plan there. Um, has anybody here read the Air Force Fiscal Year 20 Posture Review? Okay, so the Posture Review is a, um, Secretary Wilson signed it out before um, she left office in May. Uh, I think it came out in February or March. It was when they were doing their hearings on the Hill. Um, that's also 11 pages, and it's an easy read, and it shows, if you haven't read it, you can Google it, you can, you can find it or um, Chrome it, and, um, you know, download it. But my favorite line in the, the, uh, posture, the posture statement is that we will never sacrifice quality for the sake of speed. So we're talking about going faster with acquisition, but she understands and our senior leadership understand that, my, that the quality of the product, the performance, and whatever we're buying for our warfighters is what's important. And I think General Bunch got after that a little bit in the last session, telling you uh, it's not all about cost effectiveness. There is surge capacity when it's needed. We have to build in resiliency and in performance. All right, next slide. And if anybody has questions, you can raise your hand at any time. Um, so don't hesitate. Okay, we call this the Parthenon of ca uh, category management. And I'm not going to expect you to, to memorize these, but we'll talk about them just as principles of how we're building a foundation and then um, some of the um, decision points that we can make in category management. But just the, the easiest way for me when, when I was first briefed this chart and I saw it a year ago was um, try, tr trying to understand um, one of the common areas of spend of what we're looking at, 
um, category one information technology. If we go to category, if we go to category one, um, and we're talking about information technology, we want to assign a category structure. We're using that taxonomy that OMB gave us. And we're looking at our area of spend across, let's say, hardware. So we can pull out the data. We can say how much we spend on hardware using um, the, P the um, FSC codes, and P right, because it's f f federal supply schedules, or then, um, um, any of the FPDS and G data that we have in the, in, on the contracting side or our program management side looking at those tools to say, okay, here's the hardware, um, certain types of hardware we are going to give you just the volume, the dollar values, and we talked about where that category manager might have a gut instinct of where we need to focus on. And so we assign who that cost management authority is, that's the category manager, and then if they have an area that they want to look at and they assign a team to do that cur. They're going to do an analysis based on whichever area um, that they're looking at for that. So it could be across any of those, the, the, um, uh, the six category managers that we have today. Um, the, I, I do want to say that in health, I think that was there. We didn't have, um, you, you know, didn't have a green star. But the Department um, Defense Health Agency, we don't, they are the category manager, so the Air Force doesn't have or their own separate health agency, that area, category manager. But looking at the business intelligence um, for that area, making sure um, that that team kind of kicks off. And I think right now we're at the usually occur to, to release the final report um, is about 16 months. Is that right, Roger? Six, six, to, six to 16 or six? OK. Uh, the, that's the end report, but the, what they're looking at through the whole time is who are the experts that are in the government, who are the industry POCs, like businesses today that are selling that commodity, um, what are like industries that are selling that commodity or might even buy that commodity, and what is the actual requirement today and where it might need to change. And so th that in a nutshell is what the CUR team will do. But they're collecting information, they're conducting interviews, they're pulling data so that they can synthesize it in a report and give it to the category manager to make actionable decisions. And that's what will go and be briefed in front of um, our chief CMO every three months and to get the thumbs up or thumbs down. And if it's a thumbs down, what's interesting about our process in the Air Force is that we will hold that recommendation um, even if it's disapproved at the time for posterity. So I'll always go into the, what we call like the sandbox and we'll hold it to see maybe we need to come back and maybe there's a better time to look at that. Um, but any of those recommendations that come out of that CUR report will stay forever. And then we'll prioritize them like we do um, for most things. You have a question, sir? Yep. I, I can't, do we use something like what? Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, we do re request for information. And because we have the data of uh, contracts that have been awarded up to the time where CUR is kicked off, we will know um, who actually may have a contract that's active. Good question. Um, and the last one is then, uh, uh, of course, trying to come up to the decisions, which are the, the, bill, the columns of each of them. And that's why that acquisition solution column is in purple, because it's not the one that we most often go to. You will actually see things um, in category management where we're shaping the demand. We're going after maybe a policy or a new, um, an old policy and crafting it or that we might be adopting an industry best practice. And those are the goals. All right? Next slide. All right, these are some examples because it, the, the vignettes, I think, are the, um, a lot, they're a lot telling versus just reading the slides. Um, help, helping educate wise, taxiway lighting um, for LEDs, the, uh, the not just 
buying LEDs at the Air Force bases and installations that need taxiways, um, need the lighting on their taxiways, but moving from LEDs until the um, base, um, moving to LEDs instead of the, um, was it fluorescent that they used to use, actually saved 60% in reduction in energy consumption. And so the LEDs that we have in our house um, has moved on to more um, businesses. And so this was something that the team targeted. And it's pretty cool because it's also um, you know, energy efficient, not just saving money, um, but saving our, our actual consumption of energy. The elevator maintenance one, this is um, the result of 22% savings, but the elevator maintenance that was done at most of the installations, we said earlier there's 75 installations, everybody was doing it individually. And so when they go out and they collect, tell us your, your um, performance work statement or your statement of work, whichever you're using at your base, to, to help the customer or to help the contractor understand what to perform they were all over the map. And so by collecting all of them, they were able to take the best language in all of the, the um, performance work statements and do one standardized one, and then that goes out to the installations, and that's the one that's directed for use. And while they will allow tailorability, um, the, the, uh, the process of using that saves time on the front end for the requirements generator, and it also saves time for being able to get out the door into a ward because you're being standardized across all locations. The client computing, we talked about the, um, um, the, the information technology, but that's going after rate and process. That's going after lower prices and also making sure that we have a, a standardized process of the, of the um, purchasing vehicles that we're using. And so over time, um, those are going to mandatory sources and that's helping our standardization and more efficiency as well. The integrated so solid waste management, um, one, of my, one of my favorite stories that um, we heard the across the United States when you're t when you're collecting how we do integrated solid waste management or refuse removal trash removal um, we got a lot of good information you asked about the data um, for how we go out for RFIs we, if you look at an Air Force base it's like if you just look at Wright Patterson and how are we compared to what's another big business around here or another big institution is some of the universities. And so by going out to the universities, we understand how they do solid waste removal and we learn a lot from them. And I think one of the, the best practices that we learned is you, when, you're, uh, when you fill up one of the big garbage bins and say you have a, um, uh, I was going to say, say you have an air show on base. I know the air show is now off base down in the Dayton airport. But when you have a big event on base and it generates a lot of trash, and now you're having to call your, your trash removal contract, uh, you know, I know you're only supposed to pick up on Mondays, but I need an uncommon pickup on Tuesday because the trash cans are overflowed. Well, that extra pickup that wasn't anticipated is now at premium prices. And so, what we asked for the universities to do, well, what do you guys do? You, you, you know, you have concerts, you have things on base, or you have things at the, at the school that are going on all the time. And when they have the events, they knew you just order two big tr trash bins, and they'll pick them up at the regular time. And so you won't have overflow, you just have more area to store the trash while it's waiting to pick up. And those types of thing, um, those types of, um, behaviors that they changed within the process of ordering, um, always they're costing the, the contractor less money to be able to perform the service, and they're costing the government less money to be able to have the services rendered. And so those were some good, good learning points that we learned. Um, and it also is the, ref the fuel reductions, which is another reason why picking up an, un you know, an unplanned pickup um, is so expensive, because I think the trucks get less than eight miles to the gallon. They're pretty, I said like two miles, two miles to the gallon. So pretty expensive to drive those big, heavy pieces of machinery. And Ohio State University helped us out with that. All right, next slide. Okay, I am not gonna read this policy to you, but what's good, Dave found this, was just released on March 20th. Um, so we have the, um, the website that you can go um, draft the, the, download the PDF. 
And we're just going to hit like some of the highlights of what came out in, in the category management, um, making us smarter so that we're using those common practi practices across the federal government. All right, next slide. All right, this is the memo. Um, we already talked about what it refers to, but it's targeting in on the data analysis so that it's really making sure that we're protecting our small businesses and socioeconomic programs. And by doing that, they, they de designated um, certain chairs and certain members that will be in these boards that they're establishing so that they will look at the small business and socioeconomic impact of our category management decisions. And so um, those are held, you know, every four to six months. I don't know when the first one's going to be held, but then since the letter just came out in March, they'll be incorporating those into their governance structure at the highest levels of government. All right, next slide. Dave, you're going to be very busy. He says local small business specialist, so you'll be having to go to a lot of those. All right, these are the five key category management actions and they're focused on the solutions. So do you guys have access to these slides? Are they sending them up later? OK. So um, you know, I think the, the memo itself, it's pretty lengthy. Um, yeah, so these are the, the big cuts from it. Um, but you can download it, like I said, later. Um, but looking at the solutions to make sure that um, we're consistent with whatever Congress is putting in the law, that this is going to track and so that we're holding ourselves accountable. So we're going to have vendor management strategies, the demand management strategies that we talked about, and that sharing data across the federal government. Um, the, I learned from the vignettes, so one of the federal government curves that we're doing um, is actually the military working dogs. And so it's pretty, pretty interesting that does anybody know, does anybody have any information about like, you, you know the FBI uses them, you know the DEA uses them, um, but how long it actually takes to train a, a military working dog? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Three years? That's, that's about right. So two to three years, that's a huge investment, and at the end of that time, they, that dog may not actually you know, graduate. And they'll, they'll be used for a different purpose, but they won't be able to use for that high level of um, either bomb detection or drug detection, you name it. And so the government um, right now, all these federal governments, as you can guess, are competing against each other. And so the military wants this, the, the dog that was produced that took two to three years. The FBI wants the dog that was produced. And so we're bidding each other up. So the competition for these dogs is pretty fierce. Um, our number one competitor for military working dogs is the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And so on the global market for military working dogs, it's something that, the, that will greatly benefit uh, our federal government to make sure that we're sharing best practices and understanding um, you know, the bid up period itself is, is um, crucial enough to make sure that we're not um, skewing the supply and demand signal, um, but we're, we're talking about that. And so that demand management of when you buy and um, when your competitors buy is pretty important. And so that's what this CUR is doing. And that was a kickoff um, that we kicked off in March, I think it was, February or March. And the team's doing really good. Um, and then sharing that vir virtual information across um, that the whole procurement enterprises um, pretty fascinating. So that's something that we'll be looking forward to. The train and develop the work workforce and category management principles. This is something that in Air Force Installation Contracting Center and even in AFL-CMC um, that we're trying to make sure that we're training our workforce. So in the Air Force about a year ago, Secretary Shanahan at the time directed that category management, the way that category management was being conducted by the Air Force was going to be the standard that all the services would use. And so starting last, it, um, that was a directive that he gave in April of 2018. And starting in June of 2018 and, and even earlier, we started going out to the services to train 
on what category management is to help the services, and we're still doing that today, um, making sure that um, new folks that come into OSD, um, outreaching to all of you so that you understand what it is. Um, last October, I was at the um, Society of Military Engineers, and we gave a briefing on what category management was and tried to address some of the myths there. Um, but really important for small businesses to understand it and really important for ev um, all defense industry, large businesses and the medium size and to understand what it is so that they can um, be, be um, a aware of what the principles are and be aware of what, what category management is not going after. All right, next slide. All right, so additional guidance, and this is just on um, reminding us to keep the statutory socioeconomic responsibilities um, for the OMB small business policy, reiterating what that was, um, and the aims for cost creation, cost realization, or cost avoidance, and recognition of those efficiencies that will help across the federal government. And then the last one, the note there, is making sure that we're balancing not just small businesses, but we said all socioeconomic, and we're looking at federal prison industries and Ability One through and Source America underneath Ability One. Um, but we have a lot of those, um, gu the guidance pr um, regulations that we have to follow, so we have to be aware of them. And at the highest levels of the federal government for these looks in category management, they'll be making sure that they're balancing those programs. All right, next slide. Um, the Office of Federal Procurement and Policy is the chair for that, and so they, they will be governing that, that for the, um, the board itself. All right, this is Dave and I, when we were going over these slides, um, just the, the takeaway here is this is pretty good at what it's going to do on how small business is going to be able to participate in getting feedback from small businesses while we undergo this. Um, but they haven't sent out the how yet. And so this is something that's in that policy letter that came out in March. Um, but we're looking for more details on this as well. And then, as we, as we said earlier, if you, if you don't remember anything about category management, but, but at those common levels of spend where we're trying to get our hands on strategic cost ownership and the total cost of owning those commodities, um, but making sure that we're m maximizing value and for the government, that maximizing that return on value is not profit per se, but in w weapons, combat capability, and warfighter. So those are pretty cool for the efficiencies that we're looking after to make sure that we can buy more with um, the savings or efficiencies that we gain. Next slide. All right, some more small business successes. And when we, we do brief, um, I said I was at the, the SAMI conference last year, um, but one of the, the feedback that we had was, well, you're, you're going to large businesses. Um, but these, these are the, um, the records of actual contract awards that went to the small business. Um, we have the carpet was awarded 25% small business. and. Um, what was interesting about that is this, the, the structure that they were able to use for the carpet, um, making sure where we went out to negotiate with small businesses so that they are, um, the, the prices are being offered by the small businesses. The prices themselves were negotiated at a high level, but the small businesses are, are then able to meet those prices and they're getting um, to be able to provide those, that, that service of carpet. Um, the middle one is the Air Force training qualification targets, and that was 100% small business. Um, the, the, the chem bio boots, the military items, we talked about the force protection, that commodity out of AFIMSC, and so very high on that. And then the PPE, the protective fire equipment for firefighters, um, also pretty exciting. And then the DFLCS. I don't, can't remember what the, the is it? Can't see the picture very well. Load carrying system. Load carrying system. Okay. Thanks. Next slide. All right. Transient alert services. 100% um, small small disadvantaged business, uh, veteran owned small business. Um, really interesting on that one. We talked about it's not just the savings, um, but over time, the reason that the category manager for that area said, "Hey, I need you to go look at transient alert services," was because when they're using um, the you know, they're on the airfield, and it's pretty important. And they were having, the at the time, um, the contractors that were performing that service were not doing very well. They weren't performing well. They were um, 
some aircraft that were going down. They were down for maintenance. And what they ended up finding out was um, kind of interesting. Um, they found this out because they went to, as, as the gentleman said, do you go out for RFIs? They went out to the contract who had the contract. And they, the number one complaint was, wow, um, contractor number one that used to do this service 10 years ago, he lost the contract, and now this new contractor is not um, performing as well. We want to go back to the old contract. Well, what they found when they did a scrub of the performance work statements was the new contractor was performing in accordance with exactly what was asked for. But then they went back and they interviewed um, the old industry um, provider and the new, the current one, the incumbent. And what had come out of the performance work statement was FOD removal. And so the original contractor was doing FOD removal and the second contractor, FOD removal was not in the contract to, be, to begin with. And so the earlier contractor, they charged more because they were doing FOD removal. The second contractor didn't have to do FOD removal. It wasn't even in the contract. But that's why all the instances were happening to the downed aircraft. And so by taking a holistic look of what we were actually asking the contractor to perform, they were able to go back, update the performance work statement, make sure that it was in compliance with what they really needed, and the contractor is then able to come back and, and ask for an equitable um, adjustment for being that do, performing that new work that was needed. And I don't even know how many aircraft they saved, but it, had they really not done and done a holistic look at all of the places you can imagine um, that that would have just continued. And people weren't really communicating, so we're really trying to partner with our with the um, suppliers in that sense. All right, Com client computer systems, we already talked about the information technology, um, digital printing and imaging. Um, uh, the, the contracts, or not contracts, but the buying behavior for information technology, not just at end of year where you might purchase more just because the um, end of fiscal year fallout money, um, but also replacing computers or your printing um, equipment more often than they have to be. And so somebody comes in, you get a brand new computer. Well, if the computer that was left there was only one or two years old, did it really need to be a brand new one? Probably, um, but what if it was only six months old and you didn't know, but you just got there? So the refresh rates and the digital printing and imaging, some of the, that refresh rates and understanding what, when and you should be buying, that's helping us across the entire Air Force. By help, you know, give standards at our comm squadrons, give standards for the contracting squadrons so that they're not buying something that um, doesn't need to be replaced yet. And I know this, this one isn't on the slide for our small business participation, um, the, the, the awardee percentages, um, but one of the contracts that we did was a roof replacement. Now, does, any, does anybody in the crowd former military? Okay, ooh, lots. Thank you for your service. The, any, been on a base with um, any wing commanders or group commanders? Okay, one. One brave soul, raise his hand. Did you ever, what, were you group commander, wing commander? Army, okay. Well, were you in charge of a, a, in garrison? Like, were you in charge of a post? Okay, so um, on the Air Force bases, the buying behavior that we discovered through looking at roof replacements was that every wing commander at the end of fiscal year, um, not every, I'm, I'm, being kind of facetious, um, a lot of wing commanders at a uh, Air Force base on their way out the door at the end of fiscal year would re get with civil engineering and replace all the roofs because now the new coming commander wouldn't have to worry about the roofs. But what they found when they went out to all the installations and they asked, when was the last time that your roof was replaced? And they asked industry, how often do you replace roofs on average? The standard was 10 years, unless something, you know, damage occurred. And the wing commanders were often replacing the roofs on all those buildings every three years on their way out the door or less. And so if I replace a roof for $100 every 10 years and I replace a roof every three years for $100, I've just bought three new roofs. I've spent $300 when I could have waited at the 10 year. And that's the type of buying behavior and the type of trends that we're looking for to make sure that we can inform 
um, leaders at separate installations, and that communication is so important. So not just from industry, but also amongst ourselves, so that we're sharing the best types of um, you know, procurement strategies. All right, next slide. All right, so here are the small business support contact information. Um, at AFIMSC and the AFICC, where we're at, um, AFIMSC is in San Antonio, um, AFICC Installation Contracting Center, we're at Wright-Patterson. Um, our director is Mary Urey. And then um, for JBSA, we have the numbers there. Wright-Patterson, we have Dave here. Um, and then for our small business DTIC office is um, that's at, uh, in, uh, at Offit, and it's uh, David Boris also. So he's protecting for both of those locations. All right, so I'm open for questions now. Any additional questions? Okay. Hi. Yes. Besides professional services? Well, I, I, I'll phone a friend. I have an answer to, but I'll let Roger go. Okay. Sir, uh, talking to the lobbyists, what they know, what they know, the support of the The other one that's interesting that is probably one of the hardest nuts to crack would be computer equipment. So if you're, if you're paying for computer equipment and you're the contractor and you're paying for it, you're going to charge it back to the government. But what if the government could negotiate your prices for your computer so you weren't negotiating for them? And we just said you would go to this service provider. That is something that we are thinking about, but we don't know how to crack that nut. But if we could solve that, it would save us money and it would save contractor and defense industry. Yes, sir. Yes, halfway does that, but it's, it's a different effort to thinking about it. Halfway is having halfway has it that access to, to get. yes, um, halfway and that sense that sense are the ones that you're supposed to use, but even though it's a mandatory source, people don't always use it. So they they are negotiating the prices and they change, um, which is what that fluctuate, which is good because. They're changing quarterly, and so you're getting the, the best price of the quarter, but it's also allowing the vendors that, that provide those services to fluctuate when cha changes change in the marketplace. And so it's a flexible document or a flexible instrument, uh, but our suppliers don't have to use that. You can't force a supplier to go, go use halfway or that sense. I feel like I should ask you guys questions. Okay, what? Go ahead, sir. So, um, uh, following the briefing, I hear the upcoming understanding you're going to have a lot of small businesses participate in that. Now, I do understand consolidation. Research and business intelligence are not the same thing. 
and the market research, you know, just far part 10, following, just doing your, your, your market research that your requirement, your customer, your mission partner is going to conduct beforehand, is not what we're doing in category management. Category management, business intelligence, is what I talked about earlier when you're setting that team together and you're taking 6 to 16 months to pull in not just your buying behavior from the past, but you're bringing in subject matter experts, you're bringing in um, businesses and industry or providers that are on the cutting edge of perhaps new technology to say, you don't have to buy this, you can buy this. Um, you know, does anybody work with like strategic materials, um, or, like asphalt, anyone here, not the construction, but um, we have airports, right, every major city, right? Well, our Air Force bases have air, um, flight lines. So you're going to have flight lines on Air Force installations, and you're going to have flight lines at major airports or medium-sized airports, and the partnering opportunities that can um, kind of like where we're going for the future. Um, there are uh, fast-setting concretes that are being produced right now that are going to change the construction industry. Right now, to cure concrete is 30 days. Well, if I'm building a runway and you know, General Brunch bought up adaptive basing, do I have 30 days to build a base? No, I might be in and out in five or seven days. And so I'm looking for what can I do to build that runway so I can operate and maybe then I go. And so, you know, partnering with research and technology, making sure that we understand that you're not buying the asphalt of the past, but you're looking at what we can buy in the future. And so, uh, you know, for the roofing piece, same thing. There's been technologies coming out all the time, and that's why that curve is so important with the business intelligence. Um, but night and day for market research. What's, what's the key takeaway? I'm going to have you all say, strategic cost oversight. <laughs> One takeaway, um, and then the really important takeaway is that um, just, just why we're having the industry day, we want to make sure that we're partnering with you, that we understand um, what your, uh, folk, you know, either information that you have for us or education that we can provide you so that we're getting the best of the, um, we're getting the best of the market, we're understanding the trends that are going on in your industries, and that we're communicating. Right. Well, thank you very much for your time, and if anybody has questions, after,